It is impossible to imagine theoretical physics without the chronic delta. You will encounter this relatively simple yet powerful tensor practically in all fields of theoretical physics. For example, it is used to write long expressions more compactly and to simplify complicated expressions. In combination with the Levi-Civita tensor, the two tensors are very powerful. That's why it's worth understanding how the Kronecker delta works. Kronecker delta ij is a small Greek letter delta, which yields either 1 or 0, depending on which values its two indices i and j take on. The maximal value of an index corresponds to the considered dimension, so in three-dimensional space, i and j run from 1 to 3. Kronecker delta is equal to 1 if i and j are equal, and Kronecker delta is 0 if i and j are not equal. Let's make some examples. Delta 1 1 is equal to 1, because the indices are equal. Delta 2 3 is 0, because the indices are not equal. A times delta 3 3 is equal to A, because the indices are equal, so the Kronecker delta is 1. And delta 2 3 times delta 2 2 is equal to 0, because the first delta yields 0, and the second delta yields 1. But 0 times 1 is still 0. In order to represent an expression like this, or an expression like this, compactly, we agree on the following summation convention rule. We omit the sum sign, but keep in mind that if two equal indices appear in an expression, then we sum over that index. Another advantage of the sum convention, in addition to compactness, is formal commutativity. For example, you may write down the expression like this, in a different order, as you wish, for example like this. This might help you see what can be shortened or simplified further. But be careful. There are exceptions, for example, with a differential operator delta j, which acts on a successor. You can't move something before the derivative that is supposed to be differentiated. So you should be careful with operators in index notation. Now let's learn some important rules using Kronecker delta. Rule number one. Indices i, j may be interchanged. Delta i, j is equal to delta j, i. Why is that? According to the definition, if the indices i and j are equal, then delta i, j is equal to 1. But then, also delta j, i is equal to 1. And if the indices are unequal, you have delta i, j is equal to 0, and delta j, i is equal to 0 as well. So you can see, Kronecker delta is symmetric. Rule number 2. If the product of two or more Kronecker deltas contains a summation index, like in this case j, then the product can be shortened such that the summation index j disappears. Delta ij times delta jk is equal to delta ik. So instead of writing two deltas, you can just write delta ik. We say the summation index j is contracted. Let's do an example to understand it better. Consider delta km times delta mn. The summation index here is m, so you can eliminate it by contracting it, and you get delta kn. Next example, delta ij times delta kj times delta in. Here you have two summation indices i and j, so in principle you can eliminate both of them. From the first rule you know that Kronecker delta is symmetric, so you can swap k and j in delta kj and then contract the index j. You get delta ik times delta in, and then you contract the summation index i. The simplified result is delta kn. Remember that the contraction order is not important here. You could have contracted i first instead of contracting j first. In both cases you get the same result, delta kn. So which wave simplification you take does not matter. Rule number three. 
If the index in AJ also occurs in delta JK, then the Kronecker delta disappears and the factor AJ gets the other index K. AJ times delta JK is equal to AK. This rule is basically another case of index contraction. This rule tells you that you can also contract summation indices that don't have to be carried by a Kronika delta. Let's make another example. Consider gamma JMK times delta NK. The summation index is K, so you can eliminate it. The result is gamma JMN. Rule number 4. If J runs from 1 to N, then delta JJ is equal to N. Why is that? According to the summation convention, the summation is carried out over J here. So delta JJ is equal to delta 1 1 plus delta 2 2 and so on, up to N. And each Kronika delta yields 1 because the index values are equal. So 1 plus 1 plus 1 and so on results in N. If, for example, like in our case, j runs from 1 to 3, then delta jj will be equal to 3. Consider a three-dimensional vector v with the components x, y, and z. You can represent this vector v in an orthonormal basis as follows. Here, ex, ey, and ez are three basis vectors which are orthogonal to each other and normalized. In this case, they span an orthogonal three-dimensional coordinate system. The Kronika delta needs vectors written in index notation. Here we do not denote the vector components with different letters x, y, z, but we choose one letter, here the letter v, and then number the vector components and the basis vectors consecutively. The vector components are then called v1, v2, and v3. One of the advantages of index notation is that this way you will never run out of letters for the vector components. Just imagine a 50-dimensional vector. There are not even that many letters to give each component a unique letter. Another advantage of the index notation is that by numbering the vector components in this way, you can use the sum sign to represent the basis expansion more compactly. It becomes even more compact if we omit the big sum sign according to the summation convention. Look how compact the vector v can be represented in the basis. v is equal to vj times ej. Here, as you know, we sum over index j. Whether you call the index j, i or k or any other letter is of course up to you. Now that you know how a vector is represented in index notation, we can analogously write the scalar product of two vectors a and b in index notation. For this we use the just learned index notation of a vector. ai ei scalar product bj ej. In index notation you may sort the factors as you like. This is the advantage of index notation where the commutative law applies. Let's take advantage of that and put parentheses around the basis vectors to emphasize their importance in introducing the Kronika delta. The basis vectors EI and EJ are orthonormal. Recall what the property of being orthonormal means for two vectors. Their scalar product yields either 1 if i and j are equal, or it yields 0 if i and j are not equal. Doesn't this property look familiar to you? The scalar product of two orthonormal vectors behaves exactly like Kronika delta. Therefore, replace the scalar product of two basis vectors with the Kronika delta. So, a scalar product b is equal to ai times bj times delta ij. If you remember the third rule, you can contract the summation index j if you want. So, the scalar product becomes ai times bi and you get exactly the definition of the scalar product, where the vector components are summed component-wise. We can write out the double summation over i and j just for practice. In other words, 
we have to go through all possible combinations of the indices i and j. So we get a1, b1, delta1, 1, 1, plus a1, b2, delta1, 1, 2, and so on. Because of the definition of Kronecker delta, only three components of 9 in total are not zero, where i equals j. So you may omit all summands with unequal indices. Using the definition of Kronecker delta, you get the scalar product you are familiar with. 